Okay, so this is the uh, uh, final meeting of the Jijang Bosal Book Club, at least for now. You know, who knows what the future might hold. But uh, tonight we'll be talking about, um, we'll be wrapping up our, our discussion of uh, Giroud's uh, book, um, uh, The Making of a Savior Bodhisattva, uh, Dizong in Medieval China. But we will, um, as usual, start with uh, chanting the um, uh, Jijang Bosal chant, uh, if I can find it. Let's see. There we go. I have several different. Let's see. Jijang. Okay, that's, that's probably it. Okay, good. Found it. All right. So I'm going to share my screen and eat myself. You can see my screen, right, Elizabeth? Yeah, okay. Jangbo sai 
장 보살 지장 보살 지장 보살 지장 보살 여러 장장하니 오마르마니 다니 사바하 오마르마니 다니 사바하 오마르마니 다니 사바하 Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, yeah. So now I can be here, I, I think. Yes. Good. All right. So tonight we're going to um, kind of finish up. Let's see. Oh, yeah. I'm going to share my screen again. I go back and forth between sharing my screen and not sharing my screen. Uh, and um, Let's see here. The first on the first first slide here. I'm calling this story time because I want to start off by um, talking about <clears throat> uh, some personal experiences that I have that help me to relate to what. Um, oh, why is this? Okay, good. I forget how to turn that off. So I don't know if could did you see captions on the bottom of the screen? Yeah, I turned those off. Not sure how they got turned on, but I was able to turn them off. Okay. So um oh yeah, how I can personally relate to what Jiru is talking about in the book. And in particular, how I can relate to um her uh taking issue with um the way that uh over the centuries, um, and, and going back quite some time, that uh, the Bodhisattva uh, Dizong or Jijang in, in the Korean tradition, or Chittigarbha in Sanskrit, or Jizo in um, Japanese, that this Bodhisattva has been kind of relegated to a um, uh, uh, to a limited uh, role um, in uh, uh, in Buddhism, and so. Uh, I'm gonna let's see. Can I? 
Oh, yeah, I can. Yeah, I'm gonna make myself a little bit bigger. So this is a little uh, Jizo statue that I have. It was actually given to me as a gift um, many years ago by a, a good friend. Um, when I was going through a very diff difficult time in my life, and um, <clears throat> Zen master Muhan Shim uh, just spontaneously uh, gave me this, uh, I'm gonna show it again, beautiful, beautiful little Jizo statue, ceramic. Um, she just, you know, said here. <laughs> and I don't remember exactly what it was that she said, uh, but she said words to the effect that, um, you know, the Bodhisattva who helps people um, through the bardo, the transition from uh, one lifetime to the next, is also able to help people through any kind of difficult period, any difficult transition uh, in life. So I didn't have to die uh, before I could get help uh, from uh, uh, Jizo, uh, Jizong, Jijong. Um, and that made a big impression on me. Um, I mean, mostly it made a big impression on me because it was such a wonderful uh, expression of of friendship. And you know, when you're when you are in a situation when you're really feeling up against things, uh, almost any act of of kindness or friendship uh, it, it feels uh, almost overwhelming, um, uh, especially when it just kind of you know appears uh, un unbidden. Uh, so there was that. Uh, and so this gave me a, a very strong personal uh, relationship to this idea of uh, 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 Jijang Bosal uh, being a bodhisattva that I could call on for help uh, at any time. <clears throat> and then another thing happened. Um, so in uh, uh, there's a, a meditation group um, that uh, uh, practice that used to uh, come and meet uh, together at uh, uh, our house in uh, Rockville, Maryland. Um, uh, and then uh, of course, during the uh, uh, COVID uh, pandemic, uh, we switched to only being virtual. And then uh, uh, we now have people who uh, live, it's just, <laughs> we're, we're continuing on as a virtual group um, uh, for the time being at least, uh, we haven't returned to um, having in, in person sitting, but, um, what happened was that when we were still meeting together in person as part of our regular chanting practice, we would chant Kwan Sin Bosal chanting, which so Kwan Sin Bosal chanting is very similar to the chant that that was just done at the beginning of this um, uh, uh, discussion, this class. Um, uh, the primary difference is that instead of Ji Jang Bo Sal, Ji Jang Bo Sal, Ji Jang Bo Sal, Ji Jang Bo Sal. You chant Quan Sam Bo Sal, Quan Sam Bo Sal, Quan Sam Bo Sal, Quan Sam Bo Sal. And um, there's a few other minor differences, but um, that's the, the, the main difference is that you're chanting the name of a different uh, Bodhisattva, uh, Quan Sam Bo Sal instead of Ji Jang Bo Sal. Uh, and so our group always chanted uh, uh, on Saturdays. We always chanted Kwan Sin Bosal chanting, except for when a request was made um, to the group. Someone would come and say, you know, a friend died or what, you know, to commemorate someone who had died. And then for the next seven weeks after the uh, after the person had died, we would uh, uh, chant Ji uh, Chang Bosal when we met on Saturdays instead of Kwan Sin Bosal. Um, and that's the tradition in Korean Buddhism is to chant uh, Jijang Bosal for 49 days, um, which is the uh, traditional time belief that uh, it takes for a person to transition through the bardo, or those, although there's there's different ideas of, about that. Um, but um, that's that's the, that's the uh, ceremonial period uh, during which um, people chant Jijang Bosal uh, when someone has died. And you know, once we started doing that, then it, it became a fairly common thing. Uh, it, you know, one of the, the things that happens in, in samsara is that people are dying all the time. Um, and so one day, uh, one of the people who was participating in that group um, uh, offered to record our chanting. And it happened to be when we were at that time, chanting, I, I, I cannot remember who it was for, um, but we were chanting Jijang Bosal in, in our practice while we were chanting. And so we got these recordings, Robert made 
Um, and uh, he did a wonderful job. I mean, he's, it was, it was um, really nice. And that's the chant, that's the chant that we play uh, at the beginning of these, these classes. That's the, that's where the Chijang Bosal chant recording comes from uh, because we were happened to be at that time um, <clears throat> uh, chanting a Jijang Bosal because someone had died. Uh, and then when our group switched to being virtual, well, then that was the recording that we had. So then we chanted Jijang Bosal all the time. Um, so my point in telling that little story uh, is that, you know, the reason that our little group in Rockville chanted Kwan Siem Bosal by default was because that's the way um, Zen Master Sung San taught uh, people to chant. We were doing chanting uh, in the tradition of uh, uh, Zen Master Sung San. Um, and uh, what he taught was that, you know, uh, in fact, ideally, uh, he, you know, in a properly fully functional Zen center where you have people, where a residential Zen center, people living there, and um, <clears throat> you, you have practice in the morning and in the evening, chanting practice twice a day. And so, uh, he, he, everybody everyone will be chanting Ponce Bosal uh, twice a day um and then the uh, Jijang Bosal would only be chanted during special times uh when people requested it for someone who had died um uh and so Kwan Siem Bosal chanting was the default taught by Zen Master Sung San and Jijang Bosal chanting was something that was done um for special occasions so Kwan Siem Bosal uh was treated as an all-purpose every day, literally every day bodhisattva, while Jijang Bosal was only called upon in special circumstances and for a special purpose, um, you know, to help someone who has died. Um, <clears throat> so here is a, a nice little quote uh, from um, a Zen Master. Um, well, yeah, I don't know if this, I don't think this is a quote from a Zen Master Sheng Yen, but it's from the Dharma Drum <clears throat> website. And this is about, um, uh, chanting the names of Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. And I just want to read this. The Buddhas of all 10 directions, despite their differing epithets, arise from the same all-encompassing wisdom and virtue. Their different names, such as Amitabha, Baisajaguru, Maitreya, and Akshobhya, actually reflect their respective vows and manifested bodies, Nirmanakaya. The point of reciting the Buddha's name lies in how well we can concentrate our minds, as opposed to the number of recitations. Beginners are advised to choose a Buddha they identify with most and start with a daily recitation practice of five to 10 minutes, preferably at a set time of day. By reciting the Buddha's name, one is empowered by the corresponding response of their compassion and vows. Practice, uh, being, practice being alone with the Buddha or Bodhisattva and will naturally develop in wisdom and merit, thereby enjoying peace and fortune. So the thing that, uh, the reason why I, I plucked this quote out is just because um, uh, whoever said this, I think gives a very good teaching uh, saying that, <clears throat> you know, choose a Buddha or Bodhisattva that you identify with, you know, someone that you, you know, that, <laughs> you know, that you relate to, that you feel a connection with and uh, chant the name of that um, uh, Buddha or Bodhisattva, Bodhisattva as part of your practice. Um, now, of course, when a group of people uh, does practice together, everybody should be chanting the same one. Um, <clears throat> and then I just want to, uh, uh, here's, here's a quote from the Kshitigarbha Sutra, um, that is the Sutra of Jijang Bosal. All beings, whether from, and this is from the chat, chapter on chanting the Buddha's name. Uh, and so there's actually, I think there's 19 uh, different Buddhas that are that, whose names are given in this uh, uh, chapter, and then it it the the instruction is to chant the names of these uh, Buddhas, all beings, whether from heaven or from the human realms, whether male or female of the present or the future, who can chant the name of one of the above Buddhas, one of these nineteen given in this chapter, will gain immeasurable merit. He or she will receive more merit if he or she chants the names of more Buddhas. Um, <clears throat> And so there is, um, uh, you know, I, I, you know, I, I don't think Kwan Siem Bosal is a bad default, um, but I do think that uh, uh, it, it's good to, um, yeah, it, it's good to have choices. And and now I want to go back to let's see, oh yeah, here. So in, in, the, in the previous class, I talked about, I went to some 
uh, Buddhist websites and looked at which um, uh, 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 Buddhists and Bodhisattvas were mentioned on those websites, and I found one that had a bunch of them. Okay, this is this is a good one. This is from um, the Buddhism Toronto website. But, but the reason why I looked at that was because I was looking at uh, oh yeah this uh, phenomenon, which is a uh, which is a major theme of of Giroux's book. Um, <clears throat> Uh, that you have to understand this was going on uh, back in the 6th to 10th centuries, which is the time period that Jewish book covers, um, that there was a certain amount of what I call a, a jostling going on, competition uh, among uh, Buddhists and Bodhisattvas. Who are you, whose name are you going to chant? That's one way of putting it. Um, and um, there's there can be something that seems a little not not quite right. Why should Buddhas and Bodhisattvas compete with each other? <laughs> but it's, of course, it's not the Buddhas and the Bodhisattvas who are competing with each other. What's happening is that um, certain practitioners have favorites. And that's, so that is, that is a good thing, actually, to have a Buddha or Bodhisattva that you feel a connection with and then to chant the name of that Buddha or Bodhisattva uh, as part of your practice. Um, that is the teachings, the teaching of the Buddha. That is a teaching that goes back to the time of the Buddha. Um, and it's also good for people to, you know, uh, to say, oh, you know, I chanted to Jijang or Akshobhya or whoever, I did, Akshobhya isn't on this list, but, you know, to, you know, to say how wonderful it is. Um, now, what, what definitely happened during this period of time, this period of history, is that people went further than that, and people said, this, this Buddha or Bodhisattva is better uh, than another, and chanting the name of this Buddha or Bodhisattva is better than another. And the clearest example of this, um, that definitely did happen, uh, even uh, even before it was even starting to happen before the sixth century, <clears throat> is that there was a, a, a quite obviously a competition between those who um, and it wasn't just a matter of chanting. Was, quite obviously, there was a competition between uh, those who uh, uh, prayed to in some form, including chanting uh, Maitreya, and prayed to be reborn. Uh, in Tushita heaven, which is where Maitreya, Maitreya is. Um, see, my, yeah, Maitreya is here on the list. Um, and then the uh, there was a competition. And so this the practice of praying to Maitreya uh, back in, in, in the beginning of the 6th century was very widespread, very popular, uh, not only in China, but also in Korea. Um, and uh, what happened was that uh, the beliefs and practices of those who were praying to Maitreya to be reborn in Tushita heaven were pretty much transferred uh, to those who prayed to Amitabha to be reborn in uh, Amitabha's pure land. <clears throat> and uh, there were uh, a, a series of, of arguments made for why this was better. Um, <laughs> And so I just want to say something about this. That on, the, on the one hand, it's good for people to have choices, and it's good for people to make choices, and it's good for people to have the freedom to make those choices. Um, and even though there, it, it might seem a little unseemly for people, for Buddhists to be arguing, oh, uh, praying to Amitabha is much better than praying to Maitreya or praying to this Buddha or Bodhisattva is much better. I mean, and and okay, so it is it is kind of unseemly, but at the same time, um, the support the the proponents of Amitabha did not go and burn down the temples of the proponents of Maitreya. It was they they discussed it, they debated it, uh, and people freely chose you know what what they preferred to do. And to this day, there's still people uh, the, the the there are still people who stick with Maitreya. In fact, there's quite a few. Um, of Chinese Buddhists who stick with Maitreya. Um, and there's one other thing that I wanted to point out about this slide from the last time. Um, the main loser was Maitreya. 
mean oh yeah so manjushri and samantabhadra i said they remained above the fray and that's probably not actually true and i i learned this from <clears throat> reading the the conclusion of Jiru's book a little bit more carefully she does she does talk specifically about manjushri oh, i still haven't i still have to, uh, i never did correct that typo in that slide uh so um there uh oh yeah so they're they're um my Jushri was part of this jostling as well. Okay, so let me see if there's anything else I wanted to go back over from last time. I don't think so. Next slide. Yeah, all right. All right, so let's get up to the present. I covered this, oops, T. I'm gonna have to find out what the default is. See, it's important to have a default. Um, <clears throat> I think having Kwan Sin Bosal as a default uh, Bodhisattva is is good. Um, all right, but now I'm kind of going through the sections of um, uh, this final chapter, um, one, one section at a time. Um, <clears throat> and so Jiru addresses a number of, of, of topics in, in kind of summing up the book. Um, and this is just a direct quote uh, from the book. Oh, yeah, this is actually the one <clears throat> where she talks about Manjushri. Um, in in Tang afterlife, afterlife practices, filial piety and the salvation of deceased kin were channels through which Buddhism permeated the family, the institution at the heart of Chinese society. In this context, Dizong was one of several key symbols in Chinese reimaginings re of Mahayana Buddhism, especially the Bodhisattva doctrine. The question must be raised. Why Dizong and not other Bodhisattvas like Manjushri, who also attracted widespread devotion during the Tang period? And here, this is uh, uh, footnote number 17, and that's down here. And so she gives some, uh, uh, some interesting um, resources that I have not followed up on. You know, I haven't had a chance. I've looked at some of them. Some of them are very, this, this book by Birnbaum, Birnbaum, who wrote the book on Medicine Buddha, also wrote a book on Manjushri that is almost impossible to find uh, unless you want to spend hundreds of dollars. Um, yeah, Dizong's cultic status in the Tang society certainly catalyzed his steady assimilation into afterlife practices. He already possessed a natural affinity with the afterlife as the savior of the six paths of rebirths uh, in the scripture on the ten wheels, but the critical factor, and this is this is Jiru's conclusion here. I think she's partly right, at least. The critical factor was no doubt Dizong's physical appearance as a monk bodhisattva, introduced early on in the scripture of the ten wheels. In medieval Chinese society, Buddhist monks quickly established themselves as ritual specialists. So, when a, um, a when a Chinese Buddhist monk is doing a um, uh, a, a a ceremony a ritual uh, for someone who has died um uh, the people the the loved ones of the one who has died can actually you know then see this monk as being the uh, uh, representative of Dizong. i think that's the point that she's trying to make um but there are other factors as well um uh, the myth of mulian and the ghost festival exemplify the buddhist monastic step establishment successful intrusion into Chinese family religion centered on procuring purgatorial cleansing and afterlife salvation for dead ancestors. If you're not familiar, familiar with Mulian, um, this is a very important um, uh, um, uh, myth um, related to the ghost festival. Um, although several did form relationships with the cult of the dead, the monk Bodhisattva Dizong furnished the most effective imagery in this cultic contest between holy monk and savior Bodhisattva. Uh, Dizong's iconography as a monk eases the paradigmatic shift from the holy monk to the savior Bodhisattva implanting, you know, so um, uh, being both a monk and a Bodhisattva, you know, this is a an, a, a, an attempt, I really have to correct some typos in this one, but this is an attempt by by uh, Jiru uh, to give to basically to answer this question. You know, if you look at, I mean, this is certainly the case for for both Kwan Sin Bosal and the Medicine Buddha both have very strong um, uh, relationship with uh, very strong uh, uh, um, 
evident in the sutras associated with the, with those bodhisattvas and buddhas um, that that they can help people during the transition from one lifetime to to the next um and so uh it's an interesting question why a design came out now another important factor uh in uh oh here's a uh, i wouldn't say a nice um uh image but this is mulian and this is ananda nanda uh, uh, mulian's uh, uh son so mulian has died you can see by her big belly she is a hungry ghost and you can see this is kind of a grainy picture but this is uh, a fire coming out of her mouth so um the 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 um uh yeah which is not good right uh from from the perspective of gender the scripture on the past vows deliberate deliberately pits the filial daughter bodhisattva pits the, at the crux of the afterlife dizan cult against the filial son monk of the ghost festival so this is uh, portraying again in, 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 in thinking of this in terms of a competition um and thus introducing the female savior who is at once a filial daughter and a virtuous saint in contrast to the wretched mother engulfed in the retributive afflictions of hell and so uh if you read through the, this is again this is uh from uh it, it's part of the section of Giroud's um uh conclusion uh and on the topic of female practice of, of filial piety, piety, piety. Um, there was already a very strong um, father son um, that, that sons had an, uh, a filial obligation to pray for their fathers um, uh, when their fathers had died. Um, <clears throat> and um, in uh, in Buddhism already had a strong, and, and that's a Confucianist sort of, in very broad strokes, that's a, that's a, that's a sort of a Confucianist view of, of the connection between filial piety and the afterlife. Um, in, in Buddhism, there was already, uh, uh, or there came to be, uh, in Chinese Buddhism especially, a strong relationship between uh, sons and uh, mothers. Um, but with the... Um, with the uh, uh, the scripture of the past vows of Chittigarbha, um, there came to be an even stronger um, connection between mothers and daughters. And so part, basically part of, of the argument that uh, Jiru is making here and that other people have made is that one of the ways that um, Buddhism in general, and not just the, the cult of this one particular uh, Bodhisattva, one of the ways that Buddhism in general gained popularity among um uh in in china was by uh, being ap appealing to women uh a women both in their in as mothers and as daughters um uh and so i i think that that is a is a pretty uh strong argument and uh one that uh i think Jiro says you know more needs to be um said about this um let's see but at the same time, she also makes the point that Buddhism, through the um, beliefs and practices associated with um, Dizan, were able to put forward, were able to make this appeal to uh, women in China, while at the same time uh, doing so in a way that was uh, compatible compatible with prescribed norms of female behavior in Tang society that is you know in line with Confucianist ideas about the family and the role of women etc um yeah all right so now I think we're at a point where it's probably a good idea to um take a uh yeah five minute break and then come back and and finish up with our kind of review of Okay, so I'm gonna
Okay, let's see. We talked about the practice of female filial piety um, from the current slide. Which also helps to answer the question of of um, uh, yeah, so it's a, it's a there's a dual question. Uh, why was it that um, why was it that Dizong came to be uh, the primary bodhisattva who was associated with um, uh, death and the afterlife, uh, even though um, other bodhisattvas also have a clear, um, if you want to put it that way, uh, have a clear um, uh, uh, legitimate claim to that. Um, and also, how 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 did it how did that come about? Those are um, very uh, closely related. But even though Dizong Dizong largely became, um, to some extent, relegated to the bodhisattva that you pray to when someone has died, uh, it ne that was never completely the, ca the case. And one particular reason for that was because of um, of Dizong's uh, relationship to um, divination, exorcism, and healing. Um, and I used to think, you know, and I've actually uh, heard people uh, uh, suggest, you know, if someone is uh, sick, um, to to chant Jijang Bosal for them. And and sometimes I think, I don't know, that's that's who you 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 chant Jijang Bosal when someone's dead. So they're not dead yet; they're just sick, you know. But in fact, uh, uh, Jijang Bosal, Dizang, is associated with healing, um, exorcism. You know, exorcism doesn't get a lot of um, <laughs> uh, focus or attention or respect from modern Western Buddhists. Uh, but, you know, the, uh, traditional Buddhism is full of demons, uh, full of, you know, every time you, every time anybody chants the eating bell chant or the morning bell chant, part of the, the ritual of doing those chants and part of the reason why you're ringing the bell is because it's believed that the sound of the bell has the ability to um, a clear an area of of demonic uh, presence um, and divination is another thing that many uh, modern Western Buddhists have little little or no interest or respect for interest in or respect for but it's always been closely associated with um, <clears throat> with Dizong and it's especially been uh, important in in modern um, uh, uh, attempts or modern movements of people who want to place greater emphasis on Dizong. So here, um, Dizong's early representation as a savior of this world in an age without Buddha left a profound imprint on the Chinese religious imagination. And this is important. So especially in the, um, in the, um, uh, uh, the scripture on the original vows of Chittigarbha, um, the, the the main sutra that's associated with Dizong. Um, uh, the Dizong, the, the role that is that is laid out for Dizong uh, in that uh, um, sutra is is not <laughs> that this is the guy that you pray to uh, when someone has died. Died. Um, the Buddha states quite clearly in that sutra that when he dies, it's actually kind of an interesting. Uh, connection, uh, it, it, you know, an interesting twist, uh, uh, plot twist. When the Buddha dies, um, he's leaving this Saha world, uh, Jambudvipa, uh, in the hands of uh, uh, Jijang, who is uh, here to uh, look after us until Maitreya comes. Um, that's one of the main themes of the um, scripture on the past vows of Chittigarbha. Um, and so the savior, the savior of this world in an age without the Buddha. Okay. Uh, it repeated. The, and so even though to, to a great extent, um, uh, uh, Dizong became relegated to the, the one that you pray to when someone has died, 
um, nevertheless, his role as a savior uh, for us and uh, as a generalized savior bodhisattva repeatedly surfaces in the history of this bodhisattva, even after his cult took on strong afterlife colorings in the eighth century. Um, the historical sources revealed the fluid imagining imagination of medieval Buddhists who drew on a rich variety of resources to conjure multiple personalities and roles for Dizong Bodhisattva, uh, which are linked to a greater or lesser extent <clears throat> Uh, to his early scriptural associations with wish granting and, anti and antidotal wish granting and antidotal dharani, that is healing dharanis, a cluster of practices, ritual healing, exorcism, divination, longevity techniques, surfacing in various permutations with impressive consistency across different genres of evidence, show how profoundly embedded Dizong was in the broader cultic milieu of the Tang. The image of the afterlife bodhisattva, therefore, cannot map Dizong's trajectories as the patron saint of Buddhist divination and repentance, or as a Buddha Taoist priest who employs spells and talismans to subjugate demons and recruit their services to assist and benefit living beings. These dimensions of the Dizong cult continue to exist long after the dominion of Dizong's afterlife function uh, and, and remain discernible in East Asian religion today. Long after the Right. Um, and so I've just put down here as an example of this, this is the um, uh, one of the one of the differences between uh, Jichang Bosal chanting and um, Quanxian Bosal chanting is that both Quanxian Bosal and Jichang Bosal have mantras for removing difficult karma. So uh, <clears throat> Let's see where is this? This is oh yeah, this isn't the this is just the mantra here. Um, this is the title of this mantra is uh, a Jijang Bosal's mantra for removing difficult karma, <laughs> and in the um, uh, in Quanxian Bosal chanting, there's a mantra, and the title of that mantra is uh, Quanxian Bosal's mantra for removing difficult karma. Let me see if I can remember that one. Let's see. Let's um, oh no, I can't remember. <laughs> I could remember it if I was doing Quanxi Bosal chanting, but anyway, but this is the one that we do when we do Jijang uh, Bosal chanting, Om Bada Mani Dani Sabaha, Om Bada Mani Dani Sabaha, Om Bada Mani Dani Sabaha. And, um, <clears throat> and so, and Jijang uh, Bosal does actually have a very strong um, uh, association with uh, the ability to remove very difficult a uh, karma and uh and and a lot of people might naively and incorrectly think that oh that doesn't sound very zen but in fact um one of the greatest uh, uh zen teachers in the history of korean buddhism uh made a point of of saying that if you if you can remove karma uh by your own actions good then you should be doing that. <laughs> if you can make make uh, make up for your your own um, uh, 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 bad deeds, you know, which is where bad karma comes from. Difficult karma comes from our own actions, uh, and and to the extent that you are able to uh, do actions that uh, 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 alleviate um, that karmic burden, good. You should do that. But if you run up against um, a, a karma that you have trouble uh, dealing with. And so what's an example of that? An example of that is if you have uh, uh, habits or behaviors that you cannot, you, you have trouble <laughs> not doing, <laughs> um, things you would like to not do, um, or things that you would like to do that you have trouble changing your behavior. That's karma. Um, and so, uh, uh, so Santesa um, recommended in fact, he said that's probably because of karma from past lives. And in order to uh, deal with uh, karmic burdens that we have from uh, past lives, uh, you need to rely on the power of mantras. All right. Now, another thing um, that is, uh, uh, let's see, let's go back. Just to see what the transition is here. So, <clears throat> yeah. 
I'm not sure why she's, she puts it this way, but a discrepancy, which she says a final discrepancy, uh, between modern and medieval Dizong uh, cult uh, needs to be addressed, namely the emergence of Mount Ji, Juhua, Juhua as a pilgrimage center of Dizong worship. Uh, so I usually try to work out the, um, you know, since my, my tradition is Korean uh, Buddhism, um, but I don't know what the sign of this is. This is kind of a more or less what the Mandarin pronunciation is, Juhua, which means um, uh, nine, uh, uh, what is it, nine blessings or nine, Hua is, uh, uh, yeah, anyway, Ju here is nine. Um, <clears throat> As mentioned earlier, Mount Jiuhua, located in southern Anhui, eastern China, is one of the four famous Buddhist mountains and is specifically concentrated to consecrated, consecrated to Dizong Bodhisattva. The cultist locus for this site is an 8th century Korean monk named Kim Chijang. So it's interesting. To me, it's very interesting that, um, uh, uh, that uh, the sacred mountain uh, for uh, uh, Jijang Bosal in China um, is considered to be a mountain sacred to Dizong because of this Korean monk who came to China and was considered to be an emanation of uh, uh, of uh, Jijang uh, Bosal. And and one of the things uh, one of the things that's very prominent in the scripture on the past vows of the original vows of Chittigarbha is the uh, is the idea of emanations. Um, uh, in fact, the 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 very beginning of the sutra uh, is the gathering together of all of the uh, uh, countless emanations of uh, Jijang Bosa from throughout the universe come together and and fuse in, into one um, being who the, who is then there present. Um, uh, for the uh, the teaching that um, of the sutra, um, oh, and of course that all takes place up in uh, not in Tushita heaven, but in Triastrimsis heaven. Um, okay, so uh, <clears throat> so one of the problems with this is that there's uh, nothing from the time of this person Kim Chijang um, that <laughs> connects him to. Uh, Dizong Bodhisattva. Uh, he was a very famous monk. He was from Korea. He came to this mountain. Uh, he was a big deal. And people, you know, he's still a big deal today. This happened um, a long time ago. Um, 8, I think, I don't know, 8, 12 or something like that, 8, 13. Um, and so it wasn't until uh, later um, that uh, this this association between this famous monk on this famous mountain uh, came to be associated with uh, this bodhisattva. Uh, let's see. Oh, he was supposedly yeah. So this is more about he. Okay, uh, it, so he was supposed to be like seven feet tall, um, and he. Uh, oh yeah, and he made friends with uh, the goddess who inhabited this mountain. Um, and uh, and then he dedicated himself to ascetic practice, including uh, eating clay. Uh, <laughs> and he became a big deal. He became very um, uh, uh, a lot of people came and uh, essentially became his disciples. Um, and okay, so when he died. This is interesting. When he died, sitting, seated, seated upright in meditation, which is the way it, um, uh, I'm going to go off on a little bit of a tangent here. So there's all of these myths about great Zen masters who die seated upright in meditation and they give their, they give their final instructions. Um, and then they, they, they die. And this is also true for many, uh, Tibetan Buddhist, um, uh, teachers um and then they remain seated in in meditation uh even in death um hakuin uh certainly one of the greatest um teachers in the history of zen um 
famously died in his sleep. Um, <laughs> and and his, his one of his disciples, um, uh, Tori Engie, uh, made a big point about this, saying how wonderful this was, how how great of a teaching this was, um, and that the um, uh, the groan that Hakuin is supposed to have given out um, in his sleep uh, when he when he died uh, was was Hakuin's final teaching, uh, and that it was it was the greatest expression of his um, enlightenment. But that's kind of Hakuin, you know. Hakuin, you know, everybody else dies in, in this very um, set way. Aqua just died in his sleep. Anyway, so this guy, uh, Kim Chijong, uh, wasn't like Aqua he died sitting up in meditation posture with his legs crossed. Uh, and, and, he, and, and they basically they walled up the cave that he was in. Uh, and then three years later, uh, they reopened it and his body had self mummified and the bones rattled like golden chains, supposedly. Well, why should I say supposedly? The bones rattled like gold, golden chains. Okay. And here is a present day uh, picture uh, of the gigantic. See, these are human beings on these stairs. You know, these are human beings down here. This is the statue of. of I, I would like someday to go and see this. This is pretty impressive, right? And this is on uh, Mount uh, Jihua. Um, the, this really didn't take place. I screwed up. I'm gonna, I've got too many typos on this. I'm going to go through and fix this up before I um, uh, make it available for everybody to download. <coughs> um, uh, this did not really take place until the Ming period. Um, it was during the uh, Shenzong, whose reign ended in 1619, uh, that Mount Jiwa gained national prestige as a pilgrimage site and was added to the list of famous Buddhist mountains, uh, Mount Aime, Mount Putuo, Mount Wutai. So Putuo is, um, Putuo is Kwan Sien Bosong, Avalokiteshvara. Wutai is uh, Manjushri, um, and Aime is Samatabhadra. So those are the four uh, great bodhisattvas. Um, <clears throat> Shenzong in 1599 uh, presented the Buddhist canon as an offering to shrines on the on all four of these mountains. Uh, so this is, I think, really the first time that we have a a solid um, evidence of the the cult of the all four of these mountains. Uh, the reimagining of, of Mount. Jihua as a pilgrimage site for Dizong worship was no doubt connected with Ming Buddhist revivals. And this is important. Um, there's a lot of stuff going on in the Ming dynasty. Uh, and, and, and not just in the Ming dynasty in general, but particularly in the Wanli era. Uh, the Wanli era uh, was important for, there was definitely a revival of the um, uh, cult uh, of Dizong during this period, uh, but there was there was a generalized Buddhist revival uh, during this period. Um, it's called the Wanli era, but it was really um, Wanli is the uh, is the name for the uh, period uh, uh, the, of the emperor, the Wanli emperor. Um, but it was actually <laughs> the emperor's mother uh, who was the one um, that was, and I can't remember her name now, um, who was responsible for sponsoring and promoting Buddhism during this period, when in fact, the emperor himself uh, was at best indifferent uh, to Buddhism. Uh, oh, yeah. And so there was another uh, very important um, uh, 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 teacher associated with, uh, with uh, Jiuhua Mountain, um, a guy named Wu Xia. Um, and Wu Xia uh, arrived at the mountain during the Wanli era. He built a hermitage, practiced asceticism, ate only berries and fruits, copied scriptures with a mixture of his own blood and golden powder. Um, and uh, his, three years after his death, at the age of 110, his body was discovered intact. It was subsequently gilded, gilded. And I've got a, a picture of that on the next slide. And installed in the palace of 100 years by Sui Gong. An imperial decree issued in 1630 by Emperor Yi Zhang announced that Wu Xia was an emanation body of a bodhisattva. 
Although the cult of Wuxia did not directly pertain to Dizong worship, Wuxia clearly followed in Kim's footsteps. That is, Kim Kim Chijong, the guy from Korea. Uh, Wuxia clearly followed in Kim's footsteps, and his rise to cultic status, no doubt, contributed to Mount Jiuhua's fame as a Buddhist pilgrimage site. Um, and if you do a Google search on, the, so this is uh, uh, Wuxia, this is the guy's name, and this is a Ju, Ju Hua Shan, um, nine. This is, this is similar to the character for flower, but it, it, it more generally means something wonderful. Um, uh, anyway, uh, then one thing you'll see, this is the, the gilded um, corpse of Wu Xia. And this is a, uh, somebody did a reconstruction of what he supposedly looks like. And so there's, this, this is, these are things that you'll find if you do an image search uh, on uh, combine uh, Wu Xia's name with the name of the mountain. Um, <clears throat> they're closely associated with each other. So, uh, all right. So the final section of the conclusion, I think it's the final section of the conclusion. Uh, yeah, is uh, just titled "Rethinking Tang Buddhism." And and here, um, uh, Jiru makes uh, some important kind of broad general points about Buddhist scholarship. Um, <clears throat> After traversing the polychromatic landscape of the Dizong cult in medieval China, what can one conclude about the history of Chinese Buddhism in general? You know, uh, ultimately, Dizong's history corroborates the conclusions that Western scholars have recently brought to the fore, namely that much of Chinese Buddhist history, as transmitted by tradition today, is constructed, which is not, uh, you know, it, it shouldn't be common to any great surprise to anybody, but in case anyone has, has not been paying attention. Um, only after the 10th century, constructed only after the 10th century, in the last 15 years, a steady stream of Western revisionist studies on Song Buddhism have dismantled the old picture of Chinese Buddhist history, that is Chinese Buddhist history, which was largely constructed in the Song dynasty, uh, which crowns Tang Buddhism as the epitome, giving rise to uniquely Chinese forms of Buddhism configured in different lineages. Okay, so there's a couple of things that are being um, uh, talked about here. Uh, <clears throat> one is that during the Song Dynasty, there was this kind of mythology that was created that the, so the Song Dynasty came after the Tang Dynasty, okay? And during the Song Dynasty, there was this uh, 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 mythology of the Tang Dynasty that the, that the Buddhism during the Tang Dynasty was they really did it right uh, during the Tang Dynasty. Uh, and then the other parallel myth that was created during the Song Dynasty was that in the uh, Tang Dynasty, there were all of these different uh, lineages and schools that were, that you could cleanly separate from one another. And that, uh, and that indeed cleanly separated themselves from one another. Um, so it, it, one of the most egregious examples of this um, is the uh, association of uh, Zhi, great uh, master, uh, with the um, uh, Tendai uh, uh, tradition. Zhi didn't set out to um, form his own separate school of Buddhism. That was, in fact, that was the last thing in the world he wanted to do. Um, GE was very interested in, in finding uh, commonalities among different uh, uh, theories and, and sutras and teachings. Um, anyway, uh, okay, a, the growing, so that's two things, two things. One is that uh, uh, the Tang, Tang Dynasty Buddhism represents the peak of Chinese Buddhism and that it also represents a, um, a time when there were clearly distinguished um, and, and, and rival and separate schools uh, and lineages of Buddhism. Um, the growing corpus of excellent studies on Song Buddhism has cast doubt on the existence of Buddhist schools in the Tang uh, and has shown lineages and patriarchates to be largely retroactive fabrications instituted in the Song to, to, to solidify the lineage's identity and thereby legitimize claims to orthodoxy and state patronage. Um, and one thing that the Jew isn't really 
um, focusing on here is that uh, the worst case scenario for this tendency um, is actually in Japanese um, uh, Buddhist scholarship. Um, they're just and, and and not just Japanese Buddhist scholarship, but Japanese Buddhism in particular. Um, uh, after the Song Dynasty, um, a Japanese I mean not Japanese Chinese Buddhism became extremely syncretic uh, and eclectic, and 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 um, everybody all all of the temples in um, in China became Zen temples, uh, even though there were also people practicing Pure Land and 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 whatever. Um, in fact, uh, one of the uh, ways of referring to a Buddhist temple in Chinese is that it is a Zen forest. Now, one of the reasons for that is because in Chinese, as in Sanskrit, the word Zen, or the word Chan, more, more particularly in Chinese, just means meditation. And so, um, anyway, so it, it can be quite confusing sometimes to distinguish uh, between what's what's Chan and what's just Buddhism uh, in uh, in China, and and the same issue occurs in Korean Buddhism because all Korean Buddhists uh, consider themselves to be part of the Zen tradition. At the same time, Korean Buddhists also chant Namo Amida Bull and do all and you know it, it's in in study the uh, uh, Avatamsaka Sutra and anyway. Uh, so maybe maybe so the reason why Zhu doesn't go too far down into this is because it gets complicated, but it's really mo only in in uh, Japanese Buddhist scholarship um, that this uh, uh, um, fixation on these different schools uh, is really important. Um, and one of the reasons for that is because modern day Japanese Buddhist scholars are members of different schools, and uh, one of their jobs in in those schools is to trace back. Um, the history of their school and everybody wants to trace the history of their school back to the Tang, which is when you know Buddhism was at its peak. Um, and then an, 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 one other really unfortunate side effect of of this mythology is that the idea that then after the Tang and especially after the Song Dynasty, oh, there's nothing to see, you know, that Chinese Buddhism you know, Chinese Zen um, pretty much disappeared, which of course it didn't. Um, there's a lot of very important things that happened in Chinese Chan uh, from the Song Dynasty up to today. Uh, uh, but there is a tendency to fixate on the Tang Dynasty um, using sources that come from the Song Dynasty and to ignore everything or in, to ignore or to disparage, uh, openly disparage everything that came um, uh, after the Song Dynasty, and even to disparage much of what was going on in the Song Dynasty as too syncretic or eclectic. Anyway, sorry. Um, <clears throat> in with the medieval design cult, we are dealing with uh, 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 rearticulations that date also to the Ming, which witnessed a renewed vigor of the cult. I'm deliberately began. Okay, so I, th I think this uh, already indicated ties between two. All right, that's good. Let's see what else we got. Okay, so. Uh, just a few things to uh, wrap things up in the last couple of minutes. Um, why do I have uh, eight pictures? Of, these are these are different representations of the tenth ox herding picture, and the, so the tenth ox herding picture is representative of, of the um, what the Bodhisattva path is all about, uh, and not separating from um, samsara. Uh, and to the extent that one has gained the ability or even gained uh, 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 release from samsara by, by one's practice, one returns. Um, so it's called returning to the marketplace and the marketplace being essentially um, uh, this world, um, the Saha world. Um, and this, the, the fat, the fat guy carrying a bag. So this is um, uh, Hotai or Budai. Who was a? Um, he lived around the tenth or eleventh, or maybe the twelfth century, um, and he was <clears throat> after after he died. He was very famous. He was famous for kind of being fat, for uh, being very generous. He, he being very poor. He carried around a bag 
uh, and would just, uh, uh, if he met someone who had money, if he met someone who was well-dressed, he would ask them for money. If he met someone who was not well-dressed or children, he would give them something from, from his bag. He always carried around things with him. He was, he was actually kind of a Buddhist uh, Santa Claus. And um, this is the same figure. Let's see, I, I might, you know, I'll aim. oh yeah. Oh, I didn't. This is, so these are some more representations of uh, Hotai or Budai. Here he is pointing to the moon. Um, this, this I think is, is interesting because the, the, the cult or whatever you want to call it of Maitreya has never really died out um, in, in Buddhism. Okay, all right. Uh, yeah, so in the last two minutes, I just want to say, since this is the last class of the um, uh, Jijang Boso Book Club, um, so I've already kind of for the last year spent my Tuesday nights um, uh, teaching this class and, and, and the other class on traditional Buddhist chanting. So I'm going to continue to be here on Tuesday nights, be here online, um, and I'm going to be chanting. Uh, and I'm going to be doing a chanting practice and inviting anybody else who wants to to come and join me. And also um, uh, twice a month, uh, I'll be, uh, for anybody who wants to, um, I'll be available for virtual uh, online interviews during during the chanting periods. Um, and so here's the the schedule that that uh, we'll be following in this uh, Tuesday night uh, traditional chanting um, get together online. Um, and the first Tuesday of the month, I want to focus on a one chant in particular. We'll start with the evening bell chant, uh, and uh, just talk about that one chant. Chant it uh, at least three times uh, together uh, and and talk about it, go over it, what does it mean? And if and hopefully people will have uh, questions or, or answers or things to say about the chant and, and to really spend some time looking at one particular chant um, and, and practicing it uh, several times together. Um, then on the, um, let's see, uh, yeah, the second and fourth Tuesdays of the month, we'll do uh, regular and special chanting. So regular chanting, um, means the evening bell chant, Amish of the Three Jewels, Kanzeon, the Heart Sutra, the Great Durrani. Um, uh, this is what Zen Master Sung San always called regular chanting. Um, special chanting is what is again what um, Zen Master Sung San called uh, uh, special chanting. But I'm I'm adding two things uh, to it. One is um, uh, we songs, a uh, song of Dharma nature, and the other is uh, Yaksa Yore Bull chanting. So we song, song of Dharma nature is a, is a wonderful, very short, it's like a two minute, one, one minute and a half long uh, chant that is a, a very uh, poetic, beautiful poetic uh, summary of the Avatamsaka Sutra. And then we'll also do uh, Jijang Bosal chanting and Thousand Ants and I Sutra chanting. And then on the third Tuesday of the month, we're going to do Diamond Sutra chanting. You can chant the entire Diamond Sutra uh, in slightly over half an hour. And so this chanting practice will take the whole thing uh, will take a little over an hour, maybe an hour, 15 minutes, which is the time that I've been using um, uh, for these classes. Uh, and um, uh, and so we'll be able to get fit in um, the entire Diamond Sutra uh, once a month, uh, chanting it in Sino-Korean. And I'll have, uh, you know, I'll have the, the 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 way to pronounce it spelled out and displayed on the screen. Um, and then uh, in months that have five Tuesdays, we'll get to chant the Diamond Sutra um, twice. So that's what I've got. Um, stop sharing now. Oops, and I'm gonna remove my pen, so I'm not so big. So. Um, we, sh we usually end with the four vows, but I also usually ask if anyone, anyone here, oh yeah, just you and me, Elizabeth, <laughs> anybody there with you? <laughs> do, you do you have any questions or anything you want to say? Yeah, okay. Well, then we should, um, let me uh, find, should have it here somewhere.
<clears throat> Sentient beings are numberless, we vow to save them all. Delusions are endless, we vow to cut through them all. The teachings are infinite, we vow to learn them all. The Buddha way is inconceivable, we vow to attain it. May whatever excellent qualities we have gained from this practice be extended for the benefit of all beings. Thanks, Elizabeth, and uh, thanks anybody who's watching this uh, on YouTube or anywhere else. Bye. Bye. Thank you.